Hi, welcome everyone. Um, thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is Sarah Cruz and I've been working with Mission D for about maybe almost six years. It's been a long time and um, I'm really happy to be here with you all today and our um, woman of the hour, <laughs> the, the, the leader of the ship, um, Corinne Winter. And uh, she is, I want to say, a um, profoundly selfless individual who has more energy than I've ever experienced. And um, she takes that energy and focuses it in a way that she can bring um, this mindfulness curriculum to so many places, um, parents, teachers, um, administration, children. Uh, she's been working with children for many years and um, she's here with us today to tell us a little bit more about her journey. Welcome, mm -hmm. Corinne. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you so much for having me. And it's been my pleasure working with you for the last six years. Sarah kind of um, is the cultural leader of Mission B because she's so embodied and so present. And um, right before we went live, we were talking about how to set our nervous system to get in sync. And I would say that Sarah definitely helps us with that culturally and so many things. You've been such a trusted leader and co-facilitator, helping me with all the teacher trainings out in California and kind of leading and managing our entire West Coast operation, which you do so gracefully. So <laughs> thanks for interviewing me and for doing all that you did. Oh, thank you, Corinne. Yeah. Um, so you, I mean, you've had, um, I think, kind of a profound and brilliant journey um, in your life to this moment, right? This is the moment that we're in right now and everything that you've done has brought you to this moment, um, including like the past two weeks, you know, really using all of your powers and all of your um, intention to collaborate with people all over the place to bring this mindfulness summit, right? Mm -hmm. To as many people as possible. And I'm wondering if, what else about your, um, journey that feels important to share with our audience today. Thanks, Sarah. Um, yeah, it's been a journey the last uh, two or three weeks. We actually put this summit together in less than a month, which is amazing because we have 35 speakers, which I'm so excited about. And they're all incredible. And they come from all walks of life with just a ton of experiences. Um, my background is I was a social worker. Um, I worked as a social worker in the foster care system for four years. I started out working in group homes in ch with children that were considered hard to place in the New York City foster care system. So they had multiple failed uh, foster placements, and then they were placed in a group home to prevent them from going into a residential treatment center, um, which was like more of an institutionalized setting. So I did that for uh, four and a half years, five years-ish, and then I went and worked as a high school social worker at Islip Schools on Long Island, which I did for a decade. Mm -hmm. So. Um, before I started Mission B, I kind of, I worked in that field of clinical social work and private practice. I also worked in the clinic. So I took a lot of um, my clinical training as a social worker um, and my work with adolescents when I first launched Mission B in my high school. And I just found that the teens could sign up voluntarily. So we put it out to the phys ed classes, like you can either do mindfulness once a week for the next eight weeks, or you can do phys ed. And um, more than 50% of the student body signed up for meditation, which was wow. pretty awesome. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that's how we started. And then um, as far as my background outside of social work, I also owned a yoga studio for a long time where I taught uh, various forms of yoga. And that's kind of where I learned my business skills to help me run Mission B um, and a bunch of other things. But basically, Mission B um, was birthed out of my experience in seeing the suffering in the students in my high school, there was 1,200 students. And with the model of counseling, I was only able to reach about 120 students a year, which was around 10%. Wow. So I started to think, even though my friend, who was also a social worker in the building at the time, and she was wonderful, was seeing around the same amount of kids, there was still 80 to 90% of the student body who wasn't receiving any mental health services. Mm -hmm. um, so I found that really tragic, and I know that there was a need I know that a lot of the kids only received about one semester of help, um, which is not enough for all four years of their entire high school, oh. high school career, right? So they have like one semester to cover like sex, drugs, rock and roll, and everything else. And it's just, it's not, um, 
a healthy model for whole child education. Yes. So I launched Mission B out of out of that need, and it's been an awesome journey so far. You've been with me, I think, pretty much the whole time. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's incredible. I um I would love uh when we can we'll talk a little bit more about your own journey with mindfulness and meditation. Um, but is there? Will can you lead us? in a little breathing or meditative yeah, sure. moment. Yeah, absolutely. In the Corinne style that you do. Yeah, sure thing. Um, my favorite practice um, in the Mission B curriculum comes from lesson one. Um, it's a lesson on neuroscience and we teach the children um, this universal breath in K through 12 and it's called the ocean breath. Mm -hmm. And the ocean breath is really about following the waves of breath that move through our bodies. So when we do it, we first fill the belly, and then the lungs and then the chest, and then we relax chest, lungs, and belly. And I do the ocean breath every day. Um, I usually do it when I'm just like sitting on the computer or I do it every night before I go to bed, sometimes in the morning. Um, but it's really a three part, part breath that I learned in yoga. So we'll start and we'll do it for about a minute or so. Okay. So roll your shoulders back and down and close your eyes. And just begin to feel your breath and notice where you feel the breath in your body. And invite your body to relax. Feel your eyes rest. And the muscles around the jaw and throat soften. Remember that your body is almost all water, so feel the fluid nature of your body, relaxing your head and neck. Relaxing your shoulders. You can physically roll the shoulders back and down again. And feel the breath rise up from the belly into the heart. release from the heart and the belly and then inhale again and feel the belly and lungs fill with breath and feel the breath rise up into the heart and then as you exhale feel a wave of relaxation simply washing down your spine and then breathe in again feel the belly and heart rise And then feel that breath just softly and gently washing down your spine. And noticing where you feel the breath and just letting go of any tension, any holding. And as you continue to breathe, just invite yourself to relax and to just move into the present moment, becoming fully present with your breath and with your thoughts. Let's take one more deep breath in together. A deep breath out. Feeling that wave release. And then when you're ready, open your eyes. <laughs> That's good. I like remembering that um, I'm mostly water. <laughs> yeah. That really felt good when you said that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sometimes our bodies get more like wood, you know, they get. Yeah. <laughs> I, or like mm -hmm. metal up in our shoulders and we get uh -huh. so just yeah, remember the that. fluid nature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like permissioning, reminding my body, oh yeah, I'm fluid. Yes. yes. Thank you, Corinne. Okay. All right. Well, um, in order to create an organization like this, oh, with the intention that um, you've done, right, um, it has to come from somewhere. Right, and um, I'm curious of your own uh, relationship with meditation, with mindfulness. Um, like, when did you start meditating, and what were some of your um, like most profound teachers on this journey? Sure. Yeah. So, when I was in 11th grade, I was a little hippie chick, and my parents were concerned about some of my activities, and they said, um, "If you want to be a hippie, you can go spend spend the summer up with your uncle Chuck in Ann Arbor, Michigan." He was, um, had taught environmental science. He did some work 
with the University of Michigan. He ran Greenpeace for the state of Michigan. And he was my, um, we call him Crazy Uncle Chuck the Hippie. That was his official title. So they sent me up there thinking, oh, just let her spend a month up there. Or so, and she'll just, she'll just want to come home and lay on the beach and, you know, never meditate again. I'm just kidding. They love Uncle Chuck, but they thought, you know, if you want to be a hippie, go love Uncle Chuck. So I, I lived with him for, I guess, three or four weeks or something. And um, I absolutely loved it. He introduced me to so many incredible mindfulness teachers and like speakers like Dr. Wayne Dyer and Thich Nhat Hanh and Ram Dass and all of these incredible teachers and Marian Williamson and Louise Hay. And when I left my Uncle Chuck's um, house, he gave me this shoebox of cassette tapes. And um, shortly thereafter, I got my first car and the radio was broken. It was an old car and the radio didn't work, but the cassette player worked. So I just listened to primarily Thich Nhat Hanh, who's a Vietnamese um, Zen Buddhist teacher. And I listened to all of his talks kind of on repeat. Mm. Um, and I did that for like a number of years. And then I, I started to buy his books and listen to his books. And that's really, he's been my primary teacher. Um, and I, my uncle Chuck is actually still one of my teachers. We went to Tibet together in 2007. We spent a whole summer in Tibet um, exploring monasteries. <laughs> yeah, and working with kids. And we actually taught English at the monastery and it was just awesome. Mm -hmm. um, but I, um, I'm not a Buddhist, I'm actually Catholic. Um, so I was raised Catholic and to me, mindfulness is not um, a religious practice. It's a secular practice. It's a, a practice that I use to calm my mind, to focus my attention, to be more present. Um, mindfulness for me um, does not come naturally at all. Sarah knows this because she's worked with me for long enough to know <laughs> that I am not naturally, I'm super type A. I'm like a go-getter, my workaholic energy. Um, so anyone who knows me who's watching this, they're like, yes, yes, that's Corinne. Um, so, you know, I have some relatives, like my brother Jeffrey, he was born mindful. He was born Zen. He was just always so chill ever since he was a little baby. And that's just not who I am in my nervous system. So I have to really work really, really hard to be calm. So even to this day, like, um, I'm not naturally patient. Like if I'm put on hold for a long time, I'm like, oh, this is so annoying. And um, I have to like bring myself back and bring myself back to my practice. And I have to start each day meditating. I meditate for 22 minutes with a timer every morning. And then I do a meditation at the end of the day at night. And then I do yoga also for about 45 minutes after my wow. seated practice every day. Wow. Pretty much every day now, yeah. I mean, there was times like when I was living, I lived at Yogananda's ashram technically. I just, he wasn't my teacher or my guru. I've never had a guru, like I said, I. Was raised Catholic, um, but it was like the most wonderful housing I could find in in the Bay Area in Palo Alto. So I lived there for six years, and they had a temple on the property. Um, but I was like a really bad meditator. Like I'd wait till like ten o'clock at night to go to the temple, and I would meditate for forty minutes, but the whole day was already gone. You know, um, and there's really like dreams. <laughs> what you have peaceful dreams. Yeah. Peaceful dreams, yeah. But I find now for me. Um, and our, and our practice changes. Like one of the people I interviewed, like they meditate at night and that works for them. If somebody has young kids, like that could work for them. For me today, mindfulness is not just like a daily practice. It's like it tends to be more integrated into the day. Um, there was a, I was a, a substance abuse counselor for a long time, like 10 years. And they would say like, pause when agitated. So like mindfulness for me is also like pausing when I'm agitated or pausing when I'm stressed. I'm like, taking a breath rather than just like running with my frustration. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that one of the things Thich Nhat Hanh taught me um, was like mindfulness is like chopping, chop wood, carry water, you know? So how can I like practice it when I'm brushing my teeth or when I'm taking a shower or when I'm eating my dinner? Um, I tend to do everything fast. So um, I could like eat like two slices of pizza without taking any breaths at all. So for me, that's just like taking a bite of pizza mindfully is like wonderful progress. <laughs> um, and I think it's just like our humanness, you know, like so many people think that what I learned through this summit and interviewing all these people, like I interviewed over 25 or 30 people somewhere around there. I think you did at least eight or 10, right? So I probably did 25. And 
what I found in interviewing all these people is that mindfulness is so simple and that none of us are really good at, I mean, some people are really good at it. Like they're definitely like, you're pretty good at it. A lot of other people are pretty good at it, but most of us are really not good at it. And most of us are not really mellow, you know, that we have to kind of work our butts off to get there. And I definitely undoubtedly fall into that category. Mm -hmm. I would definitely say, yeah. <laughs> And I love that because it is, um, it is a practice and it's, it's kind of a relationship with life, right? It's not like I did that relationship. I don't have to like check in on my mom anymore. I checked in on her on Monday, right? It's like yeah. you, we have to continue to, to notice. Um, and I appreciate the way that you integrate that into your life, right? Yeah. I, I think a couple of speakers were talking about teeth, like brushing our teeth. And if we don't brush our teeth, they get super stinky. And like on the days when you eat the most toxic, smelly food, you have to brush your teeth twice. You have to brush your teeth twice. <laughs> right? Like if you do a lot of garlic. And, and on the days when like we have the most stress, we have to meditate more. And you can give testimony to that. I've, there's been days where I haven't done that, where I haven't paused, you know, yeah. where, and, and I think that that's the most important lesson is like, how do we pause when we're having a rough day? Like the worse the day is, the more we should be meditating or I should be meditating. I'll only speak for myself. I should be meditating. Like the higher your stress or the higher my stress, the more I need the practice. Yeah. I think that's the fascinating thing about mindfulness is people will say, well, I'm just so busy and I can't do it when I'm stressed that's and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. join the club. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that part of the mind that's like, right. It's, it's kind of running the show does not even know what it feels like to relax or doesn't know the importance of it. Um, so it's, yeah, kind of holding both at the same time. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So um, it takes like a particular kind of person to want to work with kids, right? To be able to, 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 to notice like there are these precious beings and um, they need support and like, I'm the one I want to, I want to help them out. Right. And what brought you um, into that relationship with youth? Yeah. I mean, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do in college. I just know that they were like, you have to decide by tomorrow because you're a junior, like you're going into your junior year next week. And this is the last day. <laughs> yeah. I took a survey and they're like, you'd either be a good art teacher or a social worker. And I wasn't that good at art. So I was like, I think I'll just be a social worker. Oh. Um, so that's why I picked the field. But particularly with children, the more I worked through my internships and stuff and got to work with young people, especially adolescents, I just really loved working with adolescents. I felt like there was such an opportunity to influence them mm -hmm. in a positive way and to help guide them, but in a way where they find their own compass, you know, mm -hmm. as a teenager, like you're not really lost, but sometimes you feel lost. And mm -hmm. um, there's so much possibility that can be birthed in adolescence as far as like their career, how they mitigate and manage their relationships with their, with their friends, with their partners, with their family. And there's a lot to heal too between um, childhood and adulthood. There's a lot of like healing and processing where, where at adolescents, they have the capacity to say, oh, that was unhealthy and that is healthy and that's what healthy looks like and that's what toxicity looks like. And so doing these deep dives with teenagers initially as a therapist was a lot of fun for me. And I found that both the young boys and girls I worked with were like not really afraid to be vulnerable one-on-one. -on -one. So, um, and to do deep dives with me. So I, one of the highlights of my career was really counseling teens. Um, and then I think one of the reasons I got into mindfulness with teens is that they really took to it like ducks to water. Like you would, I would get them in a group or do one-on-one -on -one and do it with them once. And then after doing it with them just one time, they'd be like, can we do that meditation again? Can we do that? They were, they were so, it was such an infectious, um, thing that developed, like I had a small group of like six boys that would come down during lunch at my school. And these are like the six boys you would probably not suspect to want to do mindfulness. Like they were always in the detention room, getting in trouble, like rowdy. And within like a couple months, they were leading each other in the practices. Uh -huh. And they were still goofing off a little bit, but they were leading each other in the practices. And I was noticing that there was a, there was something different happening. Mm -hmm. And especially in work with addiction, like, if we can learn to um, like ride the wave of desire, right? Like mindfulness teaches us, we can really manage 
our um, addictions and stuff. And being an addictions counselor, I saw all the promises that mindfulness held there. Um, and then, and then when we launched Mission Beyond, I thought, oh, we should work with the little ones. Um, there was a request from a teacher working in the elementary school. And I was like, oh gosh, I don't want to work with little kids. Like, I don't want to screw them up. I'm used to talking to teenagers. <laughs> and I went down there and they were just so cute. And um, they instantly took to it, even faster than the, kid, the teenagers. Like within minutes, these kids were meditating. And um, I, I thought about my own childhood. I was a really anxious little girl. You wouldn't know it, right? Because I ran for class, whatever, you know, vice president, like all those things, captain of the tennis team. Like I was very outgoing, but inwardly I was super anxious. Mm. And I think that um, mm. that was like went unseen, you know? Mm -hmm. So how many kids are sitting in school mm -hmm. having this underlying anxiety that they can't give a name to, or they can't express, or they don't feel comfortable talking about it, but it's there inside of them. And they think they're alone with their fears, with their what if thoughts, with their emotions. And without going in and dissecting their thoughts or, or getting them like in a, in a therapy setting to talk about their feelings, you can just go into a classroom and say, this is what fear is. False evidence appearing real, right? This is a fearful thought. Mm -hmm. And this is how you cure a feel. This is how you heal a fearful thought. This is how you manage a fearful thought. This is how you manage what if thinking. And I just, when I was asked to go in the elementary school, it was in the same district I grew up in. And I thought, oh my God, what I would have done as like a second grader, uh -huh. if someone could have just taught me, I would have saved myself, I would have saved myself years and years of, of stress and anxiety. Yeah. You know, so that's like, that really drove, drove me to, to want to make a difference, you know? I love that. Yeah. yeah that's actually going to be my next question was what in your childhood, because I've noticed in a lot of the um, people that I've interviewed and just people that I've met in life, a lot of times our childhood experiences help shape the directions that we go in in our adulthood and how we choose to serve and how we choose to um, create our life. Um, yeah. And yeah, I love that. Yeah, I think it was my childhood, but I also think it was my adulthood. Like um, I have, uh, I'm the oldest of seven children. So okay. as you can imagine, my house was very well managed by my parents, which were awesome parents, by the way. Um, but being the oldest of seven children, like I always craved peace and quiet, you know? Uh -huh. And, um, and then in my early adulthood, when I was, um, in my twenties, I lost my sister and I have a picture of her right here. Her name's Beth Winter. Let me just let you oh, see her, yeah. how pretty she is. Oh. Um, so Beth, um, she was wonderful. She went to University of Rhode Island, studied at Oxford Brooks, backpacked through Europe one summer and um, right after college and came home and was experiencing some mild anxiety over a job interview. And uh, she went to her primary care physician and said, I'm having some insomnia, I'm having some anxiety, I'm really nervous. It's my first job interview out of college and I don't know what to do. So um, her primary care physician wrote her a script for a drug called Paxil, which is often prescribed for anxiety. And many people take it and they don't have problems, but a large percent of pe people do take it and do have adverse side effects. And Beth was one of those people. Mm. And just after seven days on Paxil, um, she committed suicide. It was a Paxil induced suicide as a side effect of this drug. And this was like, of course, um, really, really hard to deal with emotionally and spiritually. And it was very difficult for my family, my, especially my parents and my siblings. And, um, and I also, at the same time, not that year, but years later thought, what could I do to prevent that from happening in another child so that they have the tools when they graduate college or high school in their toolbox, they have solid tools that if they have insomnia or they have anxiety, they don't go straight to the doctor and get a prescription drug that they have a tool like mindfulness and self-regulation and all of these tools that we now teach at mission B. So what drives my like passion, because you, you felt it, it's like a wave of ugh, like passion. Oftentimes as my sister, I keep a picture. I keep that photo on my desk and another photo on my desk. And when I feel like I'm having a rough day or God, this is so hard. I just look at her picture and I think about her life and 
and her and how this program could help save lives really because if a child's feeling alone and they're depressed and they don't have any tools in their toolbox within themselves it's not in their medicine cabinet but within themselves to heal yes to feel whole to feel um, beautiful to feel complete to feel connected to other people then that's going to be a really hard thing to deal with mm. so um so that's part of what like drives my <laughs> burning passion about this work too that's beautiful i had goosebumps when you were talking i feel that um, oh, and that kind of like devotional selfless um pouring forth of your life energy in service of that because of it um thank you that's yeah. And I also, um, I know sometimes like mindfulness is hard, but like you're speaking to the, the, um, the tools that we have on the inside. And I feel like a lot of times mindfulness is a word that we use to point to our innate nature, to mm -hmm. point to aspects of um, human nature that is, um, <laughs> that is uh, incredibly wise and um and knows how is it and innately intelligent right and so we have these tools that we can offer children to help them tap into that thing that they already have inside of them yes yeah 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 they have so many tools inside of them and some of the things we teach are um well the first thing we teach is like understanding the neuroscience of stress so what happens to your amygdala and your prefrontal cortex and your hippocampus when you're stressed and for those parents who are new to mindfulness, I'll just explain that for a moment. So when you see um, a tiger in the jungle, which most of us, we don't hang out in jungles, so we're not going to see one. But when you see a tiger in the jungle, your amygdala, so you actually have one here and one here, you have two amygdalas. And it's after the Latin word almond. And it's the alarm center of the brain. So your amygdala goes off. And that inhibits the functioning of your prefrontal cortex, which is right here, and your hippocampus, which kind of loops from the... Um, around the amygdala and hippo, uh, around the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex. And when the amygdala goes off, it inhibits functioning. So it impairs cognitive functioning, information processing, memory, learning, all of that is negatively impacted. So if you're running from a tiger and someone says, what's 24 times 17? And you're a mathematician, you're like, I don't know, I'm running from a tiger. <laughs> your processor is like slowing down because your body is like, pumping with adrenaline and cortisol and all of these stress hormones. And um, it's not the best place to learn. And a lot of our children are experiencing chronic um, stress mm -hmm. and rep repeated it, re repetitive stress on the brain, um, especially kids that are facing socioeconomic adversity, um, intergenerational trauma and racism. Um, and, and, and academic, play, maybe they're placed in the wrong academic setting. And all of these stressors kind of impact the brain in a way that we're not able to produce in the way that we might be able to if we were living with a lot of privilege, with not a lot of problems, with all of our biological and physiological ne needs being met. So if you take a child who's living in a hostile environment, who doesn't have their basic needs like shelter, water, or food, um, and there's um, threats to their safety, they're, not, they're just not gonna be able to learn as well as a child who's in a, a privileged, protective, safe, nurturing environment. So what mindfulness does is it teaches us to regulate um, the amygdala, to release our stress, and it helps move us out of a stressed or sympathetic nervous state into a parasympathetic or peaceful nervous state. So we have stressed, sympathetic, and then peaceful parasympathetic. So mindfulness helps us move out of this stress state into this peaceful state. Now, all of us need that, right? Um, Cause there's tons of false threats coming at us all the time, like deadlines, paperwork, work obligations, children, our bosses, etc. So mindfulness helps us. It doesn't prevent stress from happening. I wish it did, that'd be awesome. <laughs> um, it doesn't stop stress from coming in. It helps us cope with stress when we're, we're present to it. And it helps us develop the tools to manage stress in our lives so that we can become more resilient and that we can create a container to help manage all the stresses that are coming at us. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the beauty of mindfulness. And, um, 
And I think that it's something that just can't be taught once. It has to be done every day. And um, the program that we teach at Mission B, it's, it's once a week in the classroom for 12 weeks um, for 40 minutes, but there's also daily practices. So I can talk more about that, but I don't want to keep going on, Sarah. I'll give you a chance to ask little questions. Yeah, it's okay. You're kind of like leading the way with-, with Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, it's a natural, natural course. Um, I know we, we only have a couple minutes left. And um, I was going to ask you, um, and you just kind of spoke to it, what the Mission B curriculum looks like. And then also, what are you most excited about right now, about Mission B? Um, what would you like to invite people um, into to look forward to? Um, what is kind of like, uh, what's alive for you right now um, in Mission B's programming and where it's going? Yeah. Okay, sure. So the way Mission B's um, typical program works is we offer um, three different models, really. We have um, the first model where we go in the class once a week for 12 weeks. And, we, and for those three months, the first month we teach self-regulation, neuroscience, positive thinking, being present, digital tea talks, um, ways to manage like ourselves. And the next month is about our personal relationships. So our relationship with the world practicing compassion, empathy, boundaries, mm -hmm. presence with others. And then the last month is really about cultivating things that are more like macro level, like gratitude and altruism and values. And the way we teach this is we send educators like Sarah, who have multiple degrees in psychology, social work, counseling, education, um, and also typically like yoga certification or sound healing education. And um, they go into the classroom for those three months Sometimes they get to bring a mindful mentor with them, like someone like Angel, like Sarah interviewed this week. Um, and then our second model is, oh, and then while they're doing that, the teachers are getting these incredible daily practices. So they can start their day with a breath. They can do a movement after lunch. They can do a deep relaxation after lunch. They can do a visualization or a sharing circle at the end of the day. So it's a very integrative, mindful classroom for the teacher to create a, a really healthy container in the class. The other two models are online training. So we run a couple six weeks tra six week trainings online. We do one for K through um, fifth grade and one for six through 12. And those are six weeks for like 90 minutes. And then we also have um, the summit, of course, and then the, in the weekend workshops, which we have a lot of fun at in like Santa Cruz and Austin and San Francisco and New York and Long Island where we host those. Um, what I'm most excited about this year is, well, like every other company out there and every other business out there, our company was turned upside down um, due to the COVID-19 crisis, um, which, was, which has been really difficult because all our revenue comes from schools. That's the only way we get revenue is from schools unless we get donations. So that rug was kind of ripped out from under us. So we're losing about a third of our revenue. So we're trying to come up with ways so far. So we're kept trying to come up with ways to cultivate and create content um, that can be delivered online. So creating online content is really exciting for me right now. Yeah. Um, Pre-COVID, I was most excited about our program that we launched at Stanford Children's Hospital, which was, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. which you and I went to and Lakiva did. It was awesome. And we were teaching the kids mindfulness and music and sound. And, and then our mindful music curriculum that our, our friend Friends Helped Fund, which is um, bringing mindfulness, sound healing, and hip hop into schools, <laughs> which is just like kind of the best. And um, we were just running that pilot, so we had to pull the pilot on that, um, but we're gonna continue it back in the fall. Um, but I'm really, when I think about what I'm most excited about, always, it's always like, oh my God, we have the most amazing team of educators and, um, I don't know, They're, everyone's so great and so cool at Mission B. And um, that makes me excited every day. Oh, but, yeah. um, <laughs> oh, sweet. Yeah. Well, do you have any, um, any like spark of wisdom or any, uh, like if there's like one thing that you could offer of inspiration or kind of like it's helped you in your life, right? What would you share yeah. Yeah, with our audience? I would say one thing that I learned, um, 
I think just running a nonprofit from scratch, right? Like we had no money. We had $10,000 that we raised on an Indiegogo <laughs> and we had no business model built. And I quit my job. I had a tenured social work job for 10 years and I owned a studio and I had a private practice and I just stopped everything to follow my heart. And I would get the goosebumps like you got before. And I get, I felt this magnetic pull to follow my dream. And I would encourage people to follow that, to follow their hearts, to follow their dreams, to not be afraid of uncertainty or the unknown. Everything, like right now we're living in magnified, what I call magnified uncertainty or like observed uncertainty. But in mm -hmm. fact, everything is always uncertain. We never know our time of birth. We never know our time of death. Um, and that's just how life is, you know? So learn to ride the waves of uncertainty with a courageous and faithful heart, oh. knowing that everything's going to be okay no matter what, and just follow that courageous, faithful heart of yours. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Yay. Thank you so much. Awesome. Um, I have a, can we, can we just like take three breaths together with that feeling of the courageous heart mm. yes. before we end? Is that okay? Absolutely. Okay. I, and inhaling. Beautiful. Thank you for your courageous heart, Corinne Winter. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> we love saying each other's full names anyway. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Sarah. And thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you so much. Have a beautiful, mindful day. See you next time. Mm -hmm.